My dad disciplined us for attitude. I discipline my children for attitude because attitude precedes actions. I can remember being young and, and my dad would tell us to do something and my dad would say, now if you can't do it, smile, I don't want you to do it. Golly, first time I thought he meant, well, great, I don't have to do it. <laughs> After that first spanking, let me tell you, I knew what dad was saying. This is the third and final week in our series entitled Margins. The first week we talked about how to create margin in our schedule. Last week we talked about how to create margin in our finances. And this week we're going to talk about how to create margin for our family. In other words, creating margin in our schedule for quality family time on a regular basis. Not just family time. Quality family time. People, there's a difference. So when I say difference, I mean there's a big difference between family time and quality family time. Now, of course, creating margin in our schedule for quality family time on a regular basis is going to require good time management because we're all busy. It's not that we don't want to spend quality time with our family. We want to. The problem is most of us feel like we don't have the time to do it. So let me explain a few things about time management. Believe it or not, most people have the wrong perception about time management. They think time management is all about getting organized so that you can get more done in a shorter amount of time. But that's not what time management is. Time management is not about getting more things done in a shorter amount of time. Time management is all about accomplishing the things that matter the most. Because life is short. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of James, chapter 4, verse number 14. This is one of my favorite verses. I would have probably said it different. I would have used the old George Nolan saying that the older you get, the faster life goes by. And, of course, he would have likened it to a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end of the row, the faster it comes off the row, right? Well, the Bible says the very same thing. Except it does a little bit different. Notice what it says in the book of James chapter 4 verse 14. It says, whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. No one knows what the future holds. That's why you want margin in your finances. You have no idea what tomorrow holds. And then he goes further. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes the way. Now, what God is doing is he's reminding us how short life is. Life is like a vapor. Now, I want you to underline the word vapor. Vapor is translated from the Greek word atmes. And atmes refers to a variety of steam-like substances. But it most commonly refers to the morning fog or to the steam that rises from ponds, lakes, or rivers on a cold winter morning. How many of you ever had to drive up Highway 10 on a cold winter morning? Early in the morning, you're driving up there, and as you parallel the river, you'll notice steam that's coming off of it. Well, if you have to come back in an hour or two, you'll notice it's no longer there. Yeah. When the sun comes out, the fog begins to disappear. We used to say it this way, the steam that's rising from the water burns off. How many of you used to say that? It burns off. Is that just a Nolan thing? Anyways... That's a perfect picture, though, of our lives. Just like the morning fog, we appear for just a brief time on this earth. But very shortly, just as the fog dissipates, our life is over. And for many of us, all the things that we meant to do, we haven't done. All those things on our bucket lists, well, they're yet to remain unchecked. And at the end of, the life, of our life, we're filled with regrets because we didn't accomplish what matters most. Sometimes we do a lot of things, but we really didn't accomplish what matters the most. So time management is not about doing more things. It's about accomplishing the things that matter the most. And also, let me add this. Time management is scriptural. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. This is something you need to teach your kids, especially before they go off to college. You don't want them to fail, to flunk out. And then they got to come back home or they got to take classes over again, especially if you're paying for it. 
I'll be honest with you, your kids will do a lot better in college if, they, if, if you don't pay for it and they have to pay for it themselves. Yeah, statistics bear that out. But anyways, you need to teach your children this. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. See then that you walk circumspectly. How many of you use that word every day? Just kind of throw it in, talking to your friends. And you, say, you know, I kind of walk circumspectly. Not too many of you. Well, we'll find out what it means. But notice what it says. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, I want you to underline that word circumspectly in verse 15. It's translated from the Greek word akribos, and it can mean one of two things. It can mean to be accurate and precise. A surgeon, we hope, cuts circumspectly, very accurate and precise. You know, it's kind of funny. After my triple bypass, I looked in the mirror, and it's kind of shh all over but it didn't matter he got in he got out and he did what he was supposed to do but we want our surgeons to be what we want them to be circumspectly we want them to be able to be accurate and precise when they're using that scalpel so that's the first meaning it can have the second meaning it can have is to stay focused on the things that matter the most now in this context it means the former it means to stay focused on the things that matter the most. So to walk circumspectly means to concentrate your time, your money, and your energy on the things that matter the most. You would think that's easy to do, but it's not. Most of us are time wasters. Most of us waste our money. Most of us waste our energy on things that really don't matter. I tell my staff all the time, you've got to, you've got to apply the Pareto principle. 20% of your task will produce 80% of your response. So when I do a job description, I'm sure those of you who have to write job descriptions do the same thing. When I write a job description and I'm listing all the specific responsibilities that this job entails, I let them know when I'm going over it that this, I've already applied the Pareto principle. The two things or the three things that's at the top of the list are the most important. They're the 20% that will produce 80% of the results. If you'll do the specific responsibilities that are listed first, I promise you, you'll be successful. Because you can work on the 80% that only accomplishes about 20%. And you may not be busy, 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 but guess what? We're going to have some conversations. We're going to talk. Because what matters the most, you're not getting done. In fact, if you work for someone and they give you a job description, when you look at the specific responsibilities of the listed, you need to ask them, are these listed in the top priority, top down? What's most important is number one. What's next important is number two. You need to know that. A lot of people write job descriptions and they don't do that. Therefore, you don't know what's the most important thing that you ought to be doing. Anyways, I'm getting off on that, and I really didn't mean to do that. But here's what I want you to understand. To walk circumspectly means to concentrate your time, your money, and your energy on the things that matter the most. Now, Paul didn't stop there. Look back at verse 16. He says, redeeming the time for the days are evil. Now, I want you to understand it's not saying at that time it was more evil than it is today. No. Since Adam and Eve, the days have always been evil. Until Christ returns, the days will be evil. But notice what he says. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Then he goes further. Well, let me just say this. When we read this, most of the time, we think that the key word in this verse is redeeming. But it's not. The key, the key word in this verse is the word time. You see, time is translated from the Greek word kairos. There's two ways to actually pronounce it if you do it according to Erasmus. It's kairos. That's probably what you see uh, on the uh, little slide up there. But actually, you can also translate it the modern Greek, and that's what I do. It's kairos. But anyways, time is translated from the Greek word kairos. And it should have been translated seasons rather than time because the word kairos refers to the time period designated for a specific thing. 
In other words, when it's strawberry season, we get strawberries. When it's not strawberry season, we don't get strawberries. Everyone with me? Kairos refers to a time period that's designated for a specific thing. In fact, the Greek word kairos is exactly what Solomon was talking about in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. Even if you didn't grow up in church, this passage of Scripture is very familiar to you. It's one of those Scriptures that everyone refers to. Notice what it says, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. To everything there is a season, a kairos, and a time, different word. For every purpose under the heaven. Now, some of you are thinking, but Alan, this is Old Testament. You said Kairos. That's Greek. Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Yes, but it was translated in the Septuagint. It was translated from Hebrew into Greek starting around 300 B.C. So many times you can study the uh, Septuagint and you can see exactly or get a better idea of what that Hebrew word means. And what's interesting is the word Kairos is actually used for season there. So when he says to everything there is a season, he's referring to Kairos. And those seasons only last for a certain time and then they're gone. Let me give you an example. Your kids are toddlers for just a season. And then they become grade schoolers. My granddaughter turns three years old today. Isla does. Micah sent a picture this morning of her in her pajamas and says, she looks like a three-year-old. And I looked at at her and she does. She's not a baby anymore. And you know what women usually do, but I'm kind of like this now. It's like, oh, they're growing up so fast. I mean, have you ever done that? Yeah. Your kids are toddlers for just a season. And then they become grade schoolers. And that's a different season of life. You're in a new season when they start middle school. I can remember the first time Lisa sent me to middle school to pick up Micah. Man, these kids came out and some of them were, were wearing all black. And their hair was all black. And they had piercings. Middle school! And I thought, there's no way. What in the world's going on? Yeah, that, pre, that pre-teen age pretty soon turns into a teenage stage. And trust me, that's a different season. When you get full-blown teenagers, you'll know it's a different season. And then college, marriage, and then their own family. So when it comes to your family, you're constantly going from one season to another. Yeah. You're the parents of a toddler. You're the parents of a grade schooler. You're the parents of teenagers. You're the parents of your kids going to college and you're empty nesters. Then you become grandparents. And you see the cycle of life. But you've gone through these seasons to get where you are. Now, listen to me because this is very important. If you're taking notes, I would write this down. Once a season in life is over, it's gone forever. Yeah. Moms, that's why you look at your kids sometimes. You go, I just wish I could go back. You can't. Once a season in life is over, It's over. So you better make the most of it. You better redeem the time. So the wise man focuses. He walks circumspectly on what matters the most. He focuses on what matters the most, knowing that each season is only for a certain time, and then it's gone forever. So what does he do? He redeems the time. In other words, he makes the most of it. You see, the word redeeming is, is uh, translated from the Greek word ex agorazo. And in this context, it means to make the most of. So notice what Paul was saying in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 16. See that you walk focused, concentrating on the things that matter the most, not as fools, but as the wise making the most of the seasons in life. So let me give you three time management principles that will help you to make the most of the seasons in life. All right, number one, the purpose of time management is to help you stay focused on the season of life you're in. It's meant to help you to make the most of whatever season you're in. Why? So you won't have any regrets later on in life. No regrets with your kids. No regrets with your spouse. 
no regrets as a grandparent. You know, I have to minister to a lot of people that's on their deathbed. And, you know, I never hear them say, well, I wish I'd made more money. Never hear that. Isn't that funny? I wish I'd traveled more places. Now, they might say, I wish I'd have traveled a little bit more, but it's usually because of family. The thing that people regret the most is their relationships and the lack of time they spent focused on them. Number two, the season of life you're in determines your focus. Now listen to me because this is very important. It's possible to be in two different seasons at the same time or even more than two. You might have one child that's a teenager and one that's a preschooler. You know, accidents do happen and you think you're over. And then all of a sudden you realize we're having another. We can't. They just started high school. It doesn't matter. You're getting ready to have. So you might have one child that's a teenager and one that's a preschooler. And to top it off, you might be going back to school at night to get your master's degree. That's three different seasons in life. You're in that season of life where you're working full time and going to night school. You're also in the season of life when you're dealing with a teenager. And you're also at the same time in that season of life where you've got a, a preschooler who wants your undivided attention. Moms, you know what it's like. You can't go to the bathroom without them being outside the door going, Mom, Mom, Mom. Lisa used to say, why don't they do that when you go to the bathroom? I don't know. <laughs> but Mom, they need you. <laughs> Anyways, so... It's possible, and this is what I'm saying, it's possible to be in two different seasons of life or more at the same time. And the more seasons you're in at the same time, the more difficult it is to stay focused. And let me explain why that is. When you're dealing with more than one season in life, you've got to juggle them, which means that you've got to be able to constantly change your focus from one thing to another. Years ago, my, my girls played tennis. And uh, they were having a tournament up at NSU. And I happened to see Jack Dobbins, and I sat down, and we were talking. And Jack said, Alan, did your dad ever teach you how to juggle when you were playing sports in high school? I said, no. He said, I taught all my kids to juggle. He said, it's really good for hand-eye coordination and teaching them how to focus. But he said, you know what the secret to juggling is? And he took three balls and he began to juggle. And it was like, wow, that's impressive. He said, the secret to juggling is, is two of the three balls have to be in the air at all times with only one of the balls in your hand. In other words, when you throw those balls up and you catch one ball, you have to have two balls in the air with only one ball in your hand, and then it's got to go up as you catch the other. There has to be two balls in the air and one in your hand. And then you throw that up and catch another one, and those two balls have to be in the air with one in your hand. That's the secret to juggling. Now, to jug, well, let me say this. Life is like that. Life is like juggling. To juggle the different seasons you're in, you've got to be constantly changing your focus. But let me give you a word of advice. If you don't change your focus at just the right time, you'll end up dropping one of them. So juggling the seasons in your life can be difficult. It takes practice. In fact, let me kind of explain what I'm talking about. Let's just use those three things. You've got a preschooler, you've got a teenager, and you're going back to school at night. To get your master's degree. Well, here's the thing that you have to do. When it comes time to put that preschooler in bed, you got to go up, give that preschooler a bath. You've got to go in there and do your devotion. Hopefully you're doing that. You're reading a bedtime story. You're praying with them. You're kissing them. You put them in. You tuck them in at night. And then you come down. Teenager's still up. So now you're changing things. You're not worried about school. School's up in the air. Preschoolers put in bed, so it's up in the air. That's time to focus on the teenager. So you take the teenager, spend a little time with the teenager. And then after that time, that goes up in the air, and it's time to do your homework. Because tomorrow night is school. Next night comes along, 
Daddy or mama's taking care of the preschooler and the teenager, and you're going to school. School is in your hand. You see, there are things that's up in the air that you're not dealing with, and your focus is on one thing that's in your hand at the time. You've got to learn to be able to do that. Yeah. In fact, Lisa and I, we're in three seasons right now, or actually, I'm in three seasons. We have two grown children living in two different cities, one in Kansas City, one in Tulsa. And they both have a child, so we're also grandparents. I'm also in the latter part of my ministry, the last half, the downward slope, the most important part. Yeah. So I'm constantly changing the focus from my ministry to my kids who live in different cities to the grandkids. And I'm not trying to do all three at one time. Because if I do, I promise you I won't do any of them right and I'll have regrets. I'll have regrets when I sit up here to do my sermon because I didn't prepare properly. I'll have regrets that, you know, my kids were down but I didn't really spend much time with them. And I'll have regrets that I didn't have any quality time with my grandkids because I'm not juggling all three. I'm trying to do all three things at once. And people, you can't do that in life. You've got to learn to juggle where you walk focused. That's what he meant in Ephesians chapter 5 when he says make sure that you walk circumspectly. You have to walk focused. Not as fools, but as the wise. Redeeming the time. The seasons. Because the days are evil. That's just the way life is. Yeah. Now, this brings me to my third principle. Take and wrote not notes, write this down. Number three, the wise man not only makes the most of the current season, but he also prepares for the next season in life. You see, each season builds a foundation for the next season in life. Let me say that again because that's very important. Each season builds the foundation for the next season in life. So if you screw up this season in life, it will affect the next season in life. Let me give you an example. I'm in the season of life where I'm preparing for Lisa's retirement. Every month I put money into her retirement account. And I hope that that account is growing. Because if it doesn't, I screw it up. It's going to affect Lisa's retirement. And with life, you don't get a mulligan. You don't get to go back and do it over. You get one chance at each season in life and one chance only. And when it comes to your family, it's even more important. Now, if you notice, I said Lisa's retirement. Why did I say that? Because I'm not ever going to retire. You know how I told you in marriage sometimes when Lisa's irritated at me? I look at her and I say, forever. <laughs> well, I'm up here preaching, and let me just say this, forever. <laughs> Until death do us part. Why? Because when you're called, you're called. You can retire if you want, but I can tell you this, you're called. So what to take place is when I start telling the same stories over and over again in the same sermon, and the board comes in and says, uh, it's time for you to step down when I'm 85. I'm going to preach in these country churches. Yeah. Why? Because that's what preachers do. Preachers preach. Yeah. Why well, do you think Charles Stanley's in his 80s and still preaching? Because he's a preacher. And preachers preach. So, with that in mind, those three principles, let me give you four simple ways to create margin in your schedule for quality time with your family on a regular basis. Number one, when you're at home, eat dinner together around the table. I know that all of you are busy with your kids. They're in sports. They're in cheer. They're in all of these extracurricular activities. It seems like you're always on the road. But when you're at home, you eat dinner together around the table. Not in front of the TV. In fact, the TV needs to be off. No one's reading anything. No one has a telephone at the table. Even parents. Now, if you're on call and you're a doctor, then you've got to have that telephone because you're on call. But if you're not on call, parents, you don't even have that telephone. 
You know, I have people all the time get upset with me because I don't carry a telephone. I don't have a telephone on me right now. If I had a telephone on me right now, Randall Miller would try to call me. <laughs> yeah. I don't need a telephone. Yes, yes, you do, everyone. We need to be able to get a hold of you, Pastor. Jesus didn't have a telephone. That's why I tell my wife all the time when she's upset. You need a telephone. Jesus didn't have a telephone. <laughs> yeah, but Jesus talked to God like this, she says. But anyways, we won't get there. But here's what I want you to understand. When you're at home, you eat dinner together around the table, and you'll have all these distractions. You make it family time. And let me just go further and say this. Dinner should last at least 45 minutes. If you finish eating in 15 minutes, you're not excused from the table. Listen to me, parents. I've watched some of your kids eat, and I can tell you guys aren't eating around the table because your kids have no manners whatsoever. It's embarrassing. Embarrassing. If you have sons and daughters, your sons need to be pulling out the chair for their sisters. Oh, I hated that. But now I look back at it and thanks, Dad. We had to pull out Carol's chair. You don't know how many times I got thumped on the head for walking through the door before Carol? I see these young men not opening, opening doors and holding it for women. I'm embarrassed. Well, that's misogynistic, Pastor Allen. Oh, good gosh, go hug a tree. <laughs> Teach your children to keep those elbows off the table. Teach them what silverware to use. I don't know. Well, look it up. It's called Google. <laughs> Teach your children manners. You know what's funny? I look back. I, I used to be embarrassed of my family. Because <laughs> we had to answer the phone. Nolan residence, Alan speaking. And my friends would just laugh. And when my mom and dad were, weren't around, I'd pick it up and say, hello? <laughs> Son, this is your dad. <laughs> We don't answer the phone that way. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. No one resident. Alan speaking. Yeah. You're taught that at home. Now, we also had to, when we were sitting around the dinner table, when we finished and we wanted to leave, we said, may I be excused from the table? Now, you know, my mom and dad would say, no, we're still having family time. You need to have your children ask to be excused from the table. They don't finish, get up, and go out. Families don't do that. Families talk. Families communicate. And you teach your children that they're not excused from the table until they ask and you give them permission. May I be excused from the table? Yes, you may. But don't run off. You're cleaning the dishes tonight. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm going to get you guys together. Anyways, what I've given you are the things that you need in order to have quality family time. And as I said, there's a big difference between spending time together and having quality family time. And let me explain the difference. Quality time is defined as giving your undivided attention to each other. Quality time is not watching TV together. You might be together, but the focus is on the TV, not on each other. So when you say, oh yeah, we have family time all the, all the time. We get down, we watch TV. That's not quality family time. That might be family time. You're together, but it's not quality because the focus is not on each other. So think of quality time as focusing your attention on each other. And the dinner table is the perfect place to spend quality time together. It's the perfect place to focus on your kids and what they did that day, and to find out how things are going in their life, and just listen to what they have to say. And let me tell you, if you do that from the time they are little, it will be normal to them. My wife might get upset. I'm going to tell off on this. We were dating, and the first time I ever went to eat with her family, 
They said the prayer. And I mean, everyone just went to eating. And I start asking questions. So, Dave, what are you working on? And just about everyone at the table stops eating and looks at me. What are you doing? I didn't really catch on. It took me a while. It was a little dense. And they answered, and then they all went back to eating. I asked another question to someone else. They all stopped and looked at me. And it dawned on me. When they're at the dinner table, they're eating. They're not talking. People, let me just say this. They were having family time, but they weren't having quality family time. They did not know how to, and I'm going to use an O word, visit. How many of you old people know that you go visit? My parents would come and say, we're going to go visit Granny today, or we're going to go visit Grandma and Grandpa, Nolan. They're going to go communicate. When we grew up, there was no TV in the living room. Why? That was where you visited. That's where you focused on each other. Now, I've got TV in our living room. But I have to learn. There are times when my wife will come to me, especially during football season, she'll say, you need to turn that off. Do you see the game? It's the third quarter. We just got one more quarter. I just, no, I'm just kidding. She doesn't do that to me. She's good. But here's what I want you to understand. This is where you have quality family time. Now, if the conversation... If the conversation is strained, it means that you really have some work to do in building relationships with your children. If you go home and you decide you're going to do this, let me tell you, first of all, your kids are not going to like this. What are we doing? This is stupid. This is crazy. I go to school every day. I do the same thing every day. Why would you ask me what I do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me explain something to you. Communication is key to any relationship. You want to build a bond with your kids? You communicate with your kids. Yeah. Quality time where you focus on each other. So if there's no conversation around your dinner table, it means that your conversational skills are bad. And it means you need to work on them. I tell you, something is wrong with this generation when I go to the restaurant and there's four kids sitting there and they're all on their table or they're all on their telephone. I should have got an amen on that. Now, trust me, if your kids are in high school and you've never done what I'm talking about and you decide starting tomorrow, we're going to have family time. We're going to eat her at the table and we're going to be there for 45 minutes. I want you to understand you need to expect resistance. You're going to have big time resistance. Why? Because you did not build the proper foundation in the previous season of their life. Remember what I told you. Each season builds a foundation for the next season. If your children grow up always doing that, that's what's normal. It's normal not having the TV on. It's normal not bringing your telephone to the dinner table. It's normal sitting there and talking for 45 minutes. In fact, it will be abnormal for your child to go to their friend's house. Everyone grabs their plate and they all go their separate ways. Your child's going to come home and say, you want to know why? They don't eat at the dinner table. They don't talk. Yeah, that will be abnormal. But each season builds the foundation for the previous season or for the next future season. So if you've always sat at the table and you visited for 45 minutes, that's what families do. It's normal to them. So you need to understand if you want to start it tomorrow and you haven't built that foundation in the previous seasons, you're going to have resistance. But that's okay. Can I go further? I'm sorry. I'm just going off on tangents. My dad disciplined us for attitude. I disciplined my children for attitude. Because attitude precedes actions. I can remember being young and, and my dad would tell us to do something. And my dad would say, now if you can't do it, smile. I don't want you to do it. 
golly, first time I thought he meant, well, great, I don't have to do it. <laughs> After that first spanking, let me tell you, I knew what Dad was saying. I want a good attitude when you go out to do it. Now, as soon as he left, do you think I had a good attitude? No. So Dad would come and check on me every once in a while. And when Dad came to check on me while I was doing it, as soon as he left, but you know what it taught me? I have the ability to control my emotions. I don't lose it with authority. I, I, I don't say, well, I couldn't help it. They made me mad. I was taught by my parents. Because the book of Proverbs says, if you can't control your emotions, you're like a, a defenseless city. You want to know why your kids never get promoted in their workplace? Because they can't control their emotions around their boss. That's good teaching, Pastor Allen. I'm sorry. The second thing you need to do is have, boy, I got to hurry, have devotional time. And you start when your kids are toddlers because it's so easy. In fact, it doesn't take more than 15 minutes. When your kids are little, they want to be tucked in. In fact, they don't want to go to bed. So what do they do? Oh, what a story. Fantastic. You're going to read a story to them. You're not going to read it from a secular book. You're going to read it from a Bible book. And you're going to read a Bible story. And then you're going to talk about that story. And then you're going to pray for them. And then you're going to give them some physical touch and kisses and loves. Even if their love language isn't physical touch. And tell them you love them, put them in bed. And now, that's what's normal. Now, you're going to have to tuck your kids into bed at night anyway. I don't think I've ever seen a two- or three-year-old that goes to bed on their own and says, I don't want you to tuck me in. Kids want that. So you get to kill two birds with one stone. You get to tuck them in at night, but you also get to implant the Word of God within them. They're actually begging you to do a devotional time. So here's how you do it. You read them a story, but as I said, not from a secular book. You read them a story from a, a child book that's either the greatest stories of the Bible. As they get older, the Kingstone Bible. And after you read the story, you spend five minutes talking about it and relating it to their life and your life. You know, it's kind of interesting. My oldest, Isla, I had a kind of a hard time understanding. She was telling me the whole story of David and Goliath. But the reason I had a hard time is because she was emphasizing it the way Aaron would do when he read the story. She had memorized the whole story word for word. Ask her about David. He slew Goliath and cut his head off. <laughs> she knows those stories. You're going to have to tuck them in anyway. When they get too old to tuck in, then you change the devotion times. You switch it to the mornings. Now, if you've always done these type of things, you're going to have a little resistance. It's going to be very, very tough if you, if, uh, if you haven't done it. But if you've done it, it's not going to be so. You're just switching times. You're going to have to wake up about 20 minutes early. And then I recommend that what you do is you use Project 345 in, you, in your UV you version app what that does is you read the chapter you're supposed to you talk about it for about five minutes and then you pray we're going to pray for your day if you're in extracurricular activities we're going to pray for that if you're having a tough time in one of your classes we're going to pray for that prayer builds the intimacy you know it's kind of interesting and my wife had to tell me alan this is a good thing we prayed so much for our kids that when our kids are going through something tough, they always call and say, Mom I, need, Mom, I need you and Dad to pray for this. And they'll say what we're supposed to pray for. And the other day I was griping. I said, well, they're old enough to pray for themselves. Why are they conscious? Now, Alan, well, I still pray for them, but it's like I was wondering about that. But you know what? They are so used to. I was praying for them. <laughs> no matter what they're going through. Micah says, I got a difficult surgery going on next Tuesday. Would you pray for this? Da, 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 da. Macy calls in. She says, this is taking place. Would you pray for that? We will. 
That's what you want from your kids. Now remember, each season builds a foundation for the next season. So if you've always had devotional time or devotion time, it seems normal. If you haven't, it doesn't seem normal. Yeah. I'm going to give you the two things and we're going to quit. I'm not going to expound on them. The third thing you need to do is you need to have a family night. Again, it needs to be quality time. It doesn't need to be where you just get together. And, and let me tell you, if I could go back, there's one thing I would change. When our girls were little, they wanted to have spend the night night. How many of you know what spend the night night is? Those weekends come Friday or Saturday night and the kids want to sleep in your bed. Just as a special treat. Your kids should not be sleeping in your bed all the time. Let me just say that. But every once in a while, it's okay to have a spend the night night or whatever they want to call it because you get a chance to have some quality time. Last but not least, you need to take your kids on vacation and it doesn't have to be expensive. When our kids were little, we, we'd sold the jewelry store, we'd sold the other things. God told us what to do with the money and then we went into the ministry. And let me tell you, we were poor. So we would pray that God would give us money to go to Tulsa. And God was always faithful. And we would go spend two to three days in Tulsa at a cheap hotel that had a swimming pool and go see the matinee movies that were very, very cheap. And sometimes, because we couldn't afford to eat out all the time, we actually took up deli meat and stuff in a, in a cooler. And let me tell you, our girls think they had the best childhood. Of course, we didn't have Facebook, so no one could compare their vacations to our vacations. <laughs> I know what you're doing. And I know your life ain't that great. But you need to, you need to make margin or you need to make margin or create margin for your family. And let me trust, let me say this, trust me, you will not regret it.